Hey, welcome into Shop Fix, a community joined together for the love of woodworking. My name is Connor, and in this video, I'm gonna detail the entire process of wood turning the vase by using this one as an example. I actually just finished up on it, and in this video, I'm gonna show you every single step it takes and explain the entire process. So let's get right into this. Shop Fix, it's for the love of woodworking. Wood turning a log into a beautiful vase seems like a daunting task at first, especially for a beginner, and that's how I felt starting out. But after understanding the overall process and knowing which equipment and accessories that I needed to buy to get the process done much better, well, it became a much simpler task. So my job here today is to demystify the entire process by going step by step through it and explaining why I'm doing each step. And before I dive into that process, I think it's important to go over the equipment and accessories that you need to get the job done. Now, obviously, the first thing you're going to need is a wood lathe. Now, many of you probably have already purchased one. However, for the ones that haven't, this one I bought at Harbor Freight. It's their central machinery model, and I bought it for a little under $500. So it's a great budget model. I would also recommend looking at Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist for any used models if you're on a budget. You definitely don't have to go out there and buy the most expensive wood turning lathe to get into wood turning. To turn a vase on the lathe, you really only need two types of lathe tools, and that's a roughing gouge and a parting tool. So this is a roughing gouge, and I bought this separately out of the set that I bought because I realized how important the roughing gouge was. So this is a one inch model by Hurricane Turning Tools. And so I would recommend getting a very nice roughing gouge and a one inch is a pretty good size. And so what that's gonna allow you to do is to initially rough out the stock and get it down to the size you want. And then they also allow you to create the contours and the shapes in the vase. And so this is basically the go-to tool that you're gonna be using for the entire wood turning process. The only other tool I utilize besides the roughing gouges is the parting tool. And we'll dive into the details as to why once I start wood turning the vase. The first set of lathe tools I got was the Windsor Design Set at Harbor Freight and it's super budget friendly and they've worked great so far. I have no need to go out and buy new ones. However, they do need to be sharpened before every project to make sure that that edge is sharp and they'll work properly. So I did go ahead and buy some sharpening stones that have gouge contours in them so that you can actually sharpen the right angle of the gouge and I would recommend getting a 400 grit and then a thousand grit and that's pretty much all you need to get these super sharp to turn with Okay, so when you actually go to mount the wood onto your lathe, you're gonna need two tapered spindles and So one of these spindles is gonna have teeth just like this one and that's gonna go on the front lathe and Then you're gonna have one in the back that just goes to a point and so we'll put that back here and Then when we bring these two together, that's gonna help us mount the wood Okay, so once you have your wood properly mounted between those two spindles on your lathe, you can go ahead and start roughing out the stock. However, I would highly recommend getting some safety gear, mainly a face shield. And so the face shield is going to protect your whole face from any flying chips as you're roughing out the log. Since we're on the topic of safety with the face shield, this is a good time to mention that when wood turning, it's not recommended to wear long sleeves or gloves. However, I'll oftentimes wear gloves and long sleeves to protect my arms and hands from flying debris and chips from the roughing of the stock. Because it's so aggressive and there's so many chips flying, I find it much more comfortable and safe for me personally if I'm protecting my hands and my arms from all that flying debris so I can get a nice clean cut and not worry about the feeling of anything hitting me in the hand, which would be much more distracting to me than wearing a glove. Once you have your log roughed out to the general shape that you want the vase to be, then we're going to need to flip over the vase and mount it in the four jaw chuck. But we can't mount it in the four jaw chuck until we've used the parting tool to create the proper diameter groove to mount it. And so once we use the parting tool to do that, we're going to be using this four jaw chuck to secure the vase bottom right here. And so that is going to replace the spindle with the teeth and then we'll be mounting the four jaw chuck right there. And so the reason why we need the four jaw chuck is because without it, we can't drill a hole. Because if we 
have the wood in between the two spindles, there's no way to release that side to drill a hole because it's not secured on any point. It just fall over. So once we put that new bottom and mount it on the four jaw chuck and mount it on our lathe, now we can remove the other end and then instead actually drill a hole. So once we have the vase all contoured out and the shape that we want it, then we're gonna be drilling a hole. To drill a hole into the vase to insert dry flowers, we're gonna be using a tapered drill chuck. And so this will replace the spindle on the front. And so we'll replace it with this drill chuck. And what that allows us to do is to mount a drill bit. And I recommend using auger bits because they're a bit longer than Forstner bits. So we'll insert the auger bit, mount that securely onto the tapered drill chuck and make sure that your bit is very sharp. If it's not sharp, I would use a diamond stone to get it sharp. Otherwise, there's gonna be a lot of smoke because it just needs to be sharp so they can cut the wood. If it's not cutting the wood, it's just gonna start burning and heating up. So that's something I would recommend. Make sure these are sharp. And so this is going to allow us to drill that hole into the vase for dry flowers. So that's the setup that I'm gonna be using. After you've drilled the hole out into the vase for the dry flowers, the next thing you're gonna to wanna to do is to sand the whole vase. And I recommend getting either some sanding pads, just like these, or some sanding squares. And so these go from 40 grit to 320 grit, and these go from 320 grit to 3,500 grit. And this is gonna give a nice smooth surface. However, one thing I would recommend is to make sure to go in increments or you're gonna be left with sanding marks in the wood. So if you pay careful attention and go from a low grit to a high grit in increments and sand very slowly, you're gonna be left with a nice smooth surface. After we've sanded the vase from a 40 grit all the way to 3,500 grit, and we have a nice smooth surface, and the vase is exactly how we want it, and there's nothing else we wanna to do to it, then we can remove it from the lathe. And to do that, we're gonna be using a parting tool and also this Japanese flush cut saw. And we're gonna be cutting it off of the four jaw chuck, nice and flat and flush, so we get a nice flush bottom that sits flat. And so that's the last step you're gonna be doing. And so that is a broad overview of everything we're gonna be completing. And now we're gonna be going into the practical application and all the steps that are required to complete this project. All right, so we're gonna be wood turning this elm log. And the natural tendency is to set it up on your wood lathe where the spindles meet right in the center point of the rings. Now, on this log, it's almost right in the center, so I think I can actually get away with that. However, you're not gonna always be able to do that because the center point of the rings aren't always the center point of the log. And so you have to take a tape measure out and actually measure where the center of your log is when you're mounting it onto your lathe because you have to get the log balanced. Unless it's a very, very, very small log, then you can get away with it being imbalanced because it's not very heavy. A heavier log than this is gonna have to be balanced. So you're gonna have to measure it and actually get the exact center point of the log. Once you figure out where you need to place your spindle, then you can simply hit it with a rubber mallet so the teeth sink into the wood. Now, you'll only need to do that with the spindle that has the teeth. The spindle that comes to a point will easily go into the wood without hitting it with a rubber mallet. Now we'll take our log with the spindle firmly pressed into the wood and mount it at the front of the lathe. Once that's secured in place, we can simply push the other side up against the end and place the spindle right where we need it. Now, before ever starting up the machine, there's three things that I always check. One, I make sure that everything's secure and tight. Two, I rotate the wood and make sure that it's not coming into contact with anything. And then three, I always check and make sure that I start the machine up at a low RPM rate. You'd never want to start a new project up at a high rate of RPMs. Now we can begin roughing out the stock and we'll be using the roughing gouge. And there's two things you need to keep in mind when doing this. It's the angle of the tool horizontally, and it's also the angle of the tool vertically. So here to here, 
and here to here. Those are the two things you want to keep in mind. And the proper position is starting out at about a 45 degree angle and then going into about a 35. And you want to begin with it vertically angled as well. So on the tool rest, it's going to look like this. So that's properly horizontally angled at about 45. And then we're going to rotate it vertically to an angle like that. That's going to expose a small percentage of the gouge to cut with. When you go to rough out your stock, you want to pay close attention to any high spots in the lumber and you'll want to manage those first. Once you've gotten rid of any high spots, then you can go ahead and start from one side and gently work your way across to the other side as I'm doing here to get a uniform shape. If your stock has a pretty thick layer of bark, it's going to be pretty tricky, but once all the bark is removed, your lathe chisel is going to cut much better and you'll be able to take quicker passes and much more uniform passes. From time to time, I highly recommend turning off your lathe to check your progress. In the beginning, before this log was roughed out, I had to start the RPMs at about a one or a two. And as I roughed it out, it became much more stable because it started to become balanced and centered on the lathe spindles. As that happens, you can turn the RPMs up and it can go faster and faster. Now, once I keep roughing it out and this lighter part is gone, I'm gonna see how much diameter I have left and then I can plan out the next step. Once your stock has become more uniform and your lathe chisel is cutting much easier, you can open it up a little bit and cut much deeper passes. When using a lathe tool on the tool rest, you want to be mindful of where the ends of the tool rest are, because if your tool ever slips off the tool rest, it will kick back because there's nothing holding it against the wood. With a few more passes, I think we got this elm log looking exactly how we want it. So this will be the bottom, okay? So what I can do here is I can thin out the bottom, okay? And then we can go from thin and have a nice contour going up and then go out and use the whole width of the log we have right now for the kind of like the upper midsection and leave that really wide. And then it can dramatically go back in to kind of a flare out at the top. And so that's kind of the design that I wanna do here. I think I have enough wood to do it. So let's get started. So it's a bit counterintuitive here. It seems like I'd be working at the top of the vase here. However, I am actually working on the bottom because eventually we're gonna be flipping this over to the other side. All right, so now that the bottom has been thinned out a bit, and it certainly doesn't need to be in its final shape, but now that that's done, we'll go ahead and part the bottom. The reason that we wanna do this is because we need to create a cylindrical ledge for the four jaw chuck to hold on to. The great thing is that this doesn't need to be an exact diameter. It just has to fall between the ranges of the four jaw chuck. All right, we're one step closer to finishing this face. We now have a nice cylindrical area right here for the four jaw chuck to hold on to. Now we can actually remove this log from the two spindles because we're gonna flip it around and attach it to the other side with the four jaw chuck. To do this, first we'll release the back spindle that comes to a point by just rotating that lever and then we can remove the log. Next, we'll need to remove that front spindle that has the teeth and lightly tap it with a rubber mallet to remove that spindle. Then we'll simply screw in the four jaw chuck. Once we have the four jaw chuck threaded into place, we'll go ahead and place that cylindrical ledge into the opening of the four jaw chuck. Then we'll slide the back spindle up against the log to hold it in place while we tighten the four jaw chuck. Now that we have the vase properly mounted within the four jaw chuck, we'll go ahead and begin shaping the top. The reason I turn my vase tops narrow is because I'm simply drilling a hole out in the top and so it doesn't need to be incredibly wide. Actually, if I leave it incredibly wide and drill out a small hole, it doesn't look right. Now you can leave it wide and then actually chisel out the inside, 
which is one way some people do it. However, I think it's much harder and it's not necessary because you can still insert a lot of dry flowers even though it's a small diameter hole. If any point during the wood turning process, you notice your chisel not being able to cut through the wood as easily and you don't get good shavings, it's liable that your chisel's not sharp anymore and you want to resharpen it mid-project. So we pretty much have the bottom diameter locked in. It's narrow enough so that we have a gradual rise to the top where it protrudes here. Then we have the contour to the top and really all we need to do is refine the shape. I'm not gonna bother doing anything with the top from here because I think the overall shape of the vase looks great. So we just need to refine the shape. And then we want the top narrow because we're just gonna be drilling a hole. Once I narrowed in the base top to the diameter that I thought looked best, I went ahead and made sure that the slope was as straight as possible by using a straight edge to reference where it was high and then simply knocking down those high spots to get a much straighter slope. All right, now we have the shape of this vase much more refined with my smallest roughing gouge. And pretty much at this point, we just have to get the overall shape much more smoothed up with sandpaper. There's no reason to take any chisels anymore because you're just running the risk of gouging the wood and then your design is pretty much screwed. So right when you get the shape refined and it's smooth enough for sandpaper, I wouldn't bother chiseling anymore because sandpaper is going to clean it up really quick. With a 40 grit sandpaper, this thing is going to get cleaned up really fast. Let's get to it. The 40 grit sandpaper will make quick work of getting rid of all those chisel lines. However, if you have intricate designs, you have to be careful around those spots because of how much material is removed with the 40 grit sandpaper. While you work with the low grits, you'll actually be able to shape the vase with them because of how much material that is removed. So before moving on to any of the higher grits, this is a perfect time to refine the curves of your vase. I finished sanding the vase from a 40 grit to 180 grit and that's plenty high enough for now because the next step is to drill the hole at the top of the vase and then afterwards we can finish sanding. So for this step, we're gonna have to remove the spindle and place on the tapered drill chuck and then we can drill out our hole. You'll place in the tapered drill chuck just like you do the spindle. Then you'll wanna secure your drill bit in place. For this vase, we'll be using a one inch diameter auger bit. It's important to note that this is about the longest bit that you'll need because it pretty much matches the amount of travel that I get out of the back spindle. Make sure when you go to drill out this hole that your lathe RPMs are set to match the diameter of the drill bit that you'll be using. If you get a little bit of smoke at this step, that's perfectly normal. However, if it becomes an excessive amount, you'll want to resharpen your auger bit. After this hole has been drilled out, you'll want to take sandpaper to clean up the edges, and I recommend a round over look. You'll want to continue shaping the top of the vase and refining that hole until it's exactly how you want. Once the look is achieved, then I would work my way up to higher grits. When you go to sand the vase, you'll want to make sure that you work your way up in increments. So I'm sanding right here with a 320 sanding pad. However, I've already worked my way up from 40. So I sanded with a 40 grit, then 80 grit, 120, 240, and now I'm at 320. The reason why we're diligent about sanding in increments is because we don't want to be left with rough grit lines, which will stand out and be an eyesore once we put on finish. If this process is done correctly, once you get to 3,500 grit, you're going to be left with a smooth surface that's already shining without finish. Sanding from 40 grit all the way up to 3,500 grit is definitely not the easiest task, and it's quite time consuming. However, if done right, it leaves the surface of the wood the best it can possibly be. And so this face is completely sanded, and everything's done with it besides finishing. And so that's the next step. My favorite finish to use for vases is a hard wax finish, particularly the Odie's Oil brand. The natural finish Odie's Oil is one of the best ones you can use. It's easy to apply and the finish is incredible. After the Odie's Oil has been properly stirred, you'll simply apply it with a non-woven pad. 
One thing that I notice when applying Odie's oil on a wood turning project, and this goes pretty much for any hard wax, is that you actually have to use more than a project, let's say, that isn't on the lathe. Because it's spinning, I think the hard wax has more ability to work into the wood fibers because you're really polishing it in there. And so you'll wanna use a little bit more and the finish will look incredible. After allowing the Odie's oil to soak into the wood fibers for about 20 minutes, then it's time to buff it off. The best material to buff the hard wax is a cotton terry towel. The white color is also recommended so that you can see the hard wax being buffed off. After you fully buff the Odie's oil, the finish is complete. It's that easy. To remove our finished vase from the lathe, we'll be using a Japanese flush cut saw. This will allow us to get a nice clean cut right where we parted the wood. To catch the vase, I'm using a cardboard box that's lined with a cotton terry towel. Now our vase is only one step away from being fully complete. The final step is to finish the vase bottom, and before we apply some hard wax, we're going to be sanding this so that it's completely flat when rested on a table or whatever surface that's going to be placed on. Well, from what was once just an ordinary elm log is now a beautiful vase. I've gone ahead and decorated it with these dry eucalyptus leaves, and I think that looks really great. There's a bunch of different options out there for real plant life that's been dried to decorate dry vases just like this one. So that about wraps it up. I know I covered a ton of different topics in this video, so if you have any questions about anything I did or what to purchase to do the exact same thing as I did here, well, just leave me a comment below. And I really hope you enjoyed this video. I definitely enjoyed making this vase and this is gonna be a present. So I'm just glad that I was able to show you the process and also have this beautiful present to give out. So that about wraps it up here today, but I wish you the best of luck with your future woodworking projects. Take care.